I have sociologists here. They just told me that this is going to be a really smart show. Oh, I knew that. That's why they're here. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Uh, well, Michael just said, oh, I knew you were going to out me. Said, you know, any stimulation, especially on the Friday night show, because don't tell anybody, I know, Dan, you record the Friday night show on Thursday afternoon. We always offer that disclaimer because so many things happen uh, in the Trump era between Thursday afternoon and Friday that we have to run or hump and catch up on Monday. Uh, but, uh, yes, we do have two repeat guests here who I think are phenomenal, uh, Michael Kennedy and uh, H Hillary Levy Friedman, both sociologists, both from Brown University, and the people who think that you're nothing but a bunch of liberal thinkers just throw banana peels at the TV station and, and the TV screen because it's all about a Trump hate moment, blah, blah, blah type of thing. And actually, it really isn't. Um, Fascinating conversation with Mark Patinkin about that yesterday. If you missed that, it's on FoxProvidence.com. The reason I'm thinking about it is because I just did it. Here's the latest, though, on Trump Corker. NFL. Oh, you know what? You're right. I just jump segments. It happens from time to time. You, you, know, you actually told me, don't start with that. Here's the latest. Uh, well, this is not the latest. This is three and a half weeks ago when Donald Trump lost his mind and started a fire. Wouldn't you love to okay, see one of Dan. these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! Yeah, so you, uh, a little unorganized tonight, but real. The professor says I sound real. Thank you very much. Good to have you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. You? good. Michael? Excellent. Are, are you, uh, good. I, I'm always worried about if, whether you're smiling or not, because if you're not smiling, I'm worried that you're thinking the world is coming to an end, because I know that you don't think this Trump administration is going to get us very far. Do you? I think we should be worried about tomorrow, yes. yes. But let's worry about but, the NFL but, first. But you're smiling uh, today. <laughs> you know, this, this, this NFL thing, just the reason we bring this up is because um, Professor Friedman has stats, and I'm wondering what's going to happen this weekend, because... The Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, more or less after a thumping, I guess had a, was in a bad mood and suggested that his players, if they if they didn't stand the national anthem, they'd be fired. Um, well, is that pregame, postgame, whatever? I mean, can you imagine if the Cowboys all decided, you know, 40, 53 of them say, you know what, all right, we'll test you on that. We're all kneeling. Now what do you want to do? Throw in the white flag and forfeit? Uh, I doubt that will happen because I think they all see themselves in the same game. I have a theory on it, but I'd rather hear yours. What are you thinking about this? Well, first of all, it's amazing to see the attitude reversals like over and over again and so quickly, right? So two weeks ago, Jerry Jones ne kneeled with his players hmm. in solidarity, which many other owners didn't do. Right. And now two weeks later, he's saying, you know, you must do this. And the solidarity was a response to Trump, not a Kaepernick social justice discussion per se, correct? I, does, does, does everybody get that now? I don't know if everybody gets that. Do you think everybody gets that? No, because one of the things that Trump is so effective at doing is redirecting the conversation. And, and, and stealing so, it. And stealing it. So the, this is clearly a protest against injustice in America. And he's turning it into a protest against American values. Mm -hmm. And this is where the sleight of hand works. Mm -hmm. It's not about disrespecting the flag, the military, or any other sacred American institution. It is actually celebrating America's potential to be a greater nation than it is. But the, I think you're absolutely right about the motive for the, for the whole thing, but the actual hyperbole on this, the, the big league reaction after his, I'd fire the SOB comments, was a reaction to him. It was about him and what he, what, and what he said about them. And, you know, we got, we got knuckleheads in Seekonk burning jerseys and happening all And I'm talking to him on the radio and trying to, do you understand what this was about? Oh, it doesn't matter because the flag and the veterans. And, 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 and they've completely, but it is, it's uncanny to watch it, isn't it? Yes, well, two things. One, it wasn't just about injustice, right? It's about racial injustice. So race is such a part of this conversation that I would like to touch on today. But additionally, I think what we're seeing is that the NFL is a business at the end of the day. And I think, sadly, that's where we see some of the reversals. So if you're going to hit...
the owners in the pocketbook a little bit, that's not okay. You know, we made our stand and now let's move on and worry about the bottom line. Well, I want to hear what you think about in terms of your data and your race thing, but let me just throw out something to you. I thought that Commissioner Goodell, you know, playing two ends of the middle, being too careful this week, when he wrote the this this memorandum to to the league saying, you know, we all want to, you know, we, we, we want us to stand for the national anthem. He didn't demand it. Then Trump usurped him by suggesting the tweet that he kind of won because they had demanded the players do that. Then they had to respond with a statement that said, you know, we really didn't do that. And then on Thursday, they repeated. That's not exactly what happened. All I think they need to do is communicate to the players and say, by the way, Donald Trump stole your argument. He won round one. He stole your argument. So, so this social justice conversation can appear at halftime. It can appear in the first quarter. It can appear anywhere you want. But the national anthem thing, you might as well stop beating the dead horse because we're all in business together. Um, and he stole it from you. And there's but some punch the president rhetorically in the nose. And I mean rhetorically. You know, let everybody know that we know that he stole the issue. But the league doesn't seem to have the gumption to do that. Your thought? Well, there's some talk that the Miami owner, who has been extremely supportive of the players, is now saying, you know, maybe you should stand because exactly what you said. He stole the argument. This is now actually weakening the focus that you wanted to put on social justice issues. So um, I don't know exactly what the solution will be, whether that will be players staying in the locker room and not coming out and kneeling so that, you know, just nothing is seen, which is, of course, what used to happen not so long ago at sporting events in it's the United okay. States. It's okay. It, is it in, in this fight for social justice, it's okay to say every once in a while, all right, I just got my clock cleaned. Not that, I don't think I'm wrong about what I, but in, in terms of protocol, procedure, <coughs> technique, process, I, someone switched the argument, and guess what? The platform doesn't work anymore. So we were talking about this slightly before. We think, or at least I think, Eminem has given a signal for how to move the discussion. Because he said in his video last night on the awards, or on, on uh, Wednesday night on the awards, that he has drawn a line in the sand. You can draw a line in the sand, but it doesn't mean that you have to stand still or even kneel still. What you should do is draw a line in the sand and then think about what's the next kind of protest that will change the discussion back to what you own. So I, I fully support what those following Kaepernick have been doing. But I would rather that they become even more inventive about how it is to disrupt the conversation that Trump is owning, because he always owns a fight to the finish on the same subject. What about your data? Well, I mean, the M&M thing is interesting, right? Because here's a white rapper. And again, we can't get away from race here. And what's going on? You know, I was interested in what's the racial makeup of the NFL right now, and then what's the NFL viewership. And to contrast that with the NHL, where no one is kneeling right now. So the NFL in 2016, what the players, 70% of the players in the NFL are black. Um, any guesses to how many NHL players? Are black percentage-wise, it's it's maybe two percent. Five, five, about five percent. But the viewership, be, I would think that'd be high. The viewership of the NHL is ninety-two percent white, and you're not seeing people kneeling. But the viewership um, in the NFL is slightly higher, fifteen percent black. But we see wide racial disparities in the NFL. So it's almost completely reversed. Just to give you a sense, seventy percent of NFL players are black but 73% of league employees are white. It's interesting, right? Well, Sets up a strange dynamic. Uh, I don't I mean, I, I think I follow, but I don't know where, what dynamic you're talking about. What? Well, you know, who controls the conversation? Where is this going? 97% um, okay. of the owners are white. Well, let's just, I'll, I'll tell you. The, the, Sets it the, up. Data, the data sets up all sorts of conversations. I had a conversation with Bill Reynolds from the Providence Journal, the sports columnist, last week, and we talked about this. The, the very idea that, that uh, I'll use a term that people despise, white America is, is, is acting out over their NFL. I'm a football fan. I don't like to see, I don't like to see the Giants anyway. They're on five. It's killing me. Uh, we have depersonalized these athletes for a purposefulness for which they perform. 
And we don't want these athletes' lives, points of view, and politics to interfere with that which we want them to do for us in our fantasy football leagues and in the way we cheer for them. And that is the problem in America today, I think, that we have, in a way, had a mutual exploitation going on here at these athletes who happen to be black or, or millionaires. They have achieved at a percentage of performance athletically that in a capitalist system warrants that compensation. So they are now experiencing a different lifestyle. There are many people who, I, that, that, who I'm sure are black who are thinking, you know what, these guys, you know, big deal. I'm sure there's a lot of Black Lives Matter protesters that are broke that are walking around thinking, you know, what these guys are doing is nothing compared to what we're trying to get done. But for instance, but the, 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 my, my, I mean, you guys are the guests, so I, I want to be done with this, but I am puzzled by white America's complete inability to understand that, or the base of Donald Trump to understand <laughs> that their reluctance to hear the stories of the athletes that they rely on for entertainment is a problem. It's a problem. And you know what it plays right into? I mean, this is, this is what makes this whole contest over the NFL outrageous. We own these players. Oh, we own these players. Well, who said that? Fans. We, they are supposed to be playing football for us. That's what they're paid to do. They're not paid to have a mind. They're not paid to have a soul. They're not paid to have a conscience. Right. And so here's where I would propose is like the great transition. Look at how much we're talking about this issue. When there are so many more important issues out there, but it's partially because we respect what these football players are doing because they're showing exactly as you said, that they're more than commodities to be exchanged. They are people who have viewpoints that we should respect and honor and hear. Right. And if they're going to be, but, in, but to your point, maybe there's another way that they can get this thing done because they aren't commodities. They don't have to operate in a box. There are other ways where they can get this message out. I just, you know, these moments I think are really crucial for, for American racial relationships. And what I'm disappointed on, the editorials in my fantasy football league emails, the guys that I hang out with from high school in my, that, that, that are smart, successful, and mad at these players. And I'm the guy that's going, guys, will you think about this? You know, when I go to a giant game and I spend $500, blah, 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 yeah, obviously I'm thinking about wins and losses, but I'm also, you know, I'm not not interested in who they are. There's a lot of anger right now. Going back to the Eminem rap, I mean, one of the biggest takeaways from that, besides the line in the sand, which is a great line, is just the anger that's out there. And I think this is one of the first times we're sort of seeing that anger from the other side attract, attacking Trump. I think there's still been some air of civility, and now, you know, you are questioning the foundations of our country. You know, you are questioning our right to protest or the free press or whatever it is. And so if that move, helps move the conversation forward and returns us to our roots as a great democracy, then hopefully we will be getting something positive out of this or experience. Or we just had fire yelled in a crowded theater. We'll be right back. President Trump is directing his ire at another senior Republican, Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee. On Sunday, the president tweeted, I would fully expect Corker to be a negative voice and stand in the way of our great agenda. Didn't have the guts to run. Corker, who announced his retirement last month, responded, It's a shame the White House has become an adult daycare center. Someone obviously missed their shift this morning. That wasn't all Senator Corker had to say. He later told the New York Times that Mr. Trump was treating the presidency like a reality show with reckless threats toward other countries that could set the nation on the path to World War III. And of course, we've seen uh, the, the, the establishment still seeking re-election Senate, not suggesting that Bob Corker doesn't know what he's speaking about. Good guy, just wish we'd get back to business. So none of them are saying he's wrong. Donald Trump is suggesting that he has been, and of course there's a, re a reflection on his height now from Donald Trump because that's what he does. Um, you see this is pivotal or is this just noise? Yes. Yes, pivotal? Yes, pivotal. Because it's important to keep in mind, you know, Corker's no Democrat. 
Right? He was supportive of Trump. In fact, his support early on helped Trump win. He's no longer Trump supporter. In fact, he has become even an angry critic, we could say, just to follow up on the last segment. So the thing is, and Ben Sass uh, on the Thursday morning has now come out, or Wednesday night, has come out and criticized Trump for attacking the First Amendment. So we have to ask what happened, and there are three possibilities, right? The first is, is that things are so bad in the world that we are walking away from this Iran uh, nuclear agreement, that we're threatening North Korea, that we're causing this kind of catastrophe in Puerto Rico by not saving the island like we have the capacity to do, that this level of catastrophe is moving someone as responsible as Corker to go angry. Or secondly, and this is, I think, contributing to it, there's an overall failure of governance. And it's not just that he's not getting legislation through. He's using executive orders to make things worse for the people who are most at risk. Well, in well this something country. that he, you know, he 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 just he just wasted Barack Obama over during the campaign. Executive orders. He's now using executive orders to undo the health care program. I mean, as we tape this program this morning, Thursday morning for Friday night, uh, he's he's running executive order allowing for cross state commerce and, and formation of different groups to be able to buy health insurance. Um, your husband, by the way, who's brilliant on this stuff, who's also been a guest here, uh, is our next guest next week because i got to figure out what this executive order actually does to the health care program because I can't figure it out in 30 minutes, that's for sure. Uh, but it's amazing that he's now Mr. Executive Order because he can't get anything done in the legislature. Uh, your thoughts on the Clarker thing and, and, and whether it's real and whether it's a, is, is, it a, is it a fly in the ointment or is it the beginning of something that's real, really systemic? I would like to see action, right? It's great that people are now talking because it was, you know, a pox on well, the House of the Republicans. I don't know how many people Republican. are talking on the record. That's well, what right, makes it that's unique what, you know, This Corker. is someone talking on the record. You know, there was talk, just like there was Harvey Weinstein talk, right? Mm. But now saying it on the record, but what's going to happen? what is going to be the actual response. We have to wait and see. But this is a powerful senator. Um, and well, he well, has well, the potential well, to really lead an you, investigation. When most, when most people say, I want to see what's going to happen, they have an idea of what they'd like to see happen. Well, there are so a lot what do, you, of, what do you want to see happen? There are talks of calling um, hearings to expose maybe some of the misdeeds that are going on with foreign relations. and. That would be highly concerning. Outside the Russian investigation? Outside the Russian investigation, right, about Iran or North Korea. So the, just, the most proximate, it's a thing, lot the most right proximate right thing facing Trump right now is the uh, Russia investigation with Comey and Mueller, Mueller following, right? I can't help but think that Trump's escalation of conflict right now against the NFL or against Corker or against any of his many growing enemies is a way of distracting us from the real thing that's coming down the road that's going to take him down. And we've talked about this so many times on the show, and that is what Mueller has on him. And it only gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's not just him. It's going to be his whole family and many of his advisors. So that's the show that I'm waiting to this see. This Vanity Fair article, um, and I'm sorry we didn't post it for you, but you should read the Vanity Fair article that, that cites uh, sources, again, which I'm sure the president will call fake news, just like he called the NBC report about Tillerson calling him a moron fake news, and the idea that he was uh, a precursor to that, which caused Tillerson to call him a moron, suggesting that he wanted nuclear capability 10 times what we have. Uh, da, 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 da. These are established media, news. Or, I think even the people who buy into the fake news thing know that these are established news organizations that have a practice. They're not going to get everything right all the time. But the truth of the matter is, is that they're just not throwing this stuff around. Um, it's not part of a grand conspiracy. These journalists do their work. Uh, but reportedly, the Vanity Fair article, you know, talks about you know multiple sources, Republicans and White House officials, who are, are who are openly uh, on background, not off the record, but on background, saying the guy's coming unhinged. That he's that he's more than moody. That he's depressed and he's and, he, and he's he's lashing out and he's talking about how much he hates everybody in the White House. And, I mean, these things. I don't know if they're going to end up being a product of this the, the the proper disruption that everybody wanted to see, or the beginning, of the end that's coming real quickly. I do do you, do you, do you, 
I mean, we've been thinking that for several months. We yeah, always, but we're only nine but, months into the presidency. It feels like nine years, but we're only nine months in. It's true, but we just can't know. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, the attack on NBC, you know, you can just read the tweets that are going out, you know, this is how it starts. This is how a dictatorship starts. This is how we start eroding people's rights by attacking the media. But we've been attacking the media. So what's different this time? It's not clear to me what's different and what will be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Well, you've often worried about this, this process of totalitarian type of right. you know, thing. But the, the refreshing thing is, is that the media hasn't stood down. The media is not standing down. It's not happening. Nobody's standing down. And in fact, you know, maybe that's what's got him so upset. The resistance to Trump is growing deeper and broader. I don't the know, the base isn't really peeling away. No, the base isn't peeling away, but the people who were on the sidelines are now saying this is a time for us to stand up and have our profiles encouraged, recognized. Now, the thing that I am, you know, absolutely worried about. Stop. Though, I'm looking at the clock. When we come back, what he's absolutely worried about. Stay with us. What are you worried about? I'm worried about the escalation of violent conflict within our country. I'm worried about people listening to Trump and saying, those are not true Americans and they deserve to be attacked. They're already being threatened, these football players, and that's beyond the American pale. That is our racial injustice heritage, but it should not be our democratic future. Share the same concern? I don't know. I mean, I hope that we do not, I mean, we already have physical altercations. I hope that we are not, you know, back in the Detroit riots um, at some point. I don't know how that will be reflected, but we still don't know what motivated the Vegas shooter. So, you may be right. Uh, I'm, I'm not ready. You're not. You're not no, it's you're not, not Vegas you're not shooter. Not what Vegas I'm, shooter. you know, no, I'm not, yeah. yeah, I know that's not what. But I think what Trump would love is to have a violent conflict somehow be generated, and he can say, "See, that's their fault. It's not me. I'm the one who's bringing law and order to this country." But he's and certainly that, not unifying people, and that's what we need in a right. president. We need someone who's going to be a unifier in a time of tragedy or well, unifi- in a time of conflict. Unifying would be, would be a byproduct of motive for being the president. His, his motive, does, I mean, listen, there's a level of narcissism and in, 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 in a huge ego in any national platform politician. But I never, I've never seen the unification and bring the country together as motive from day one. We got 20 seconds. Remember Steve Bannon and what he's trying to do. Mm-hmm. He's trying to blow up the Republican Party right now because he and Trump thrive on the fight, not on leadership or governance. Or the outcome. Or the outcome. That's irrelevant. The fight is what matters. I, I'm, now I'm more worried than I was before. I'll worry through the weekend. All right. Well, enjoy. It's supposed to be nice weather. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Oh, my goodness. Final word when we come back. All righty. Uh, keep a smile on your face. Keep an eye on the ball games. Maybe not for the outcome. Uh, and celebrate. Oh, is this okay to say? Listen, I know there are a lot of Yankee fans in Rhode Island still. Celebrate the idea that the Yankees have advanced. Mr. Gardner's at bat on uh, Wednesday night was maybe the best at bat we've seen in a long time. Come on, Kev, lighten yep. up a little bit. The world doesn't revolve around the Red Sox and the Patriots. I gotta go, have a good weekend. See you Monday on the Radio 3 on WPRL. Bye.